Well, welcome to uh, our first ever fireside chat. I apologize warm for the lack hands. of a fireplace. Warm our, pretend to warm our hands by the fire with our little <laughs> whiskey. Yes, but we do have whiskey to warm our hearts and our souls cheers. and minds. Yeah. So cheers, boys. Thank cheers. you for joining us. Cheers, Andrew. Uh, excited to have the founders of Charm City Bluegrass on the show who are independently uh, incredible people in their own careers. So excited to talk about CCB and what you guys are up to in general. But uh, yeah, thanks for joining. Cheers. Yeah, buddy. So why don't we start off if you guys can... Maybe just individually introduce yourselves, and then we can get into CCB for a little bit. Sure. sure. My name is Adam Keir. I am partner with Phil at Charm City Bluegrass, and I'm the marketing director for the Freshgrass Foundation. Great. And I am Phil Chorney, founder uh, of Charm City Bluegrass. Oh, uh, well, I'm talking to you. We're having a conversation. I'm just founder, <laughs> founder of Charm City Bluegrass, also the CEO of Baltimore Management Agency, which uh, manages touring, uh, nationally touring musicians. Also, the uh, you forgot to mention our co-talent buyers. Co-talent buyer for, for the, the Fells Point, Point Fun, Fest. Fun Fest. And I'm also the project manager for marketing for Del Fest, which is a bluegrass festival as well as also the marketing director for the um the boogie down music festival and um i don't think i missed anything there you do some ramble stuff too, oh right? yeah that's right and the talent buyer for and partner at uh, ramble fest how could i forget that it was just like two weeks ago well in full disclosure you're the manager of shoe and the souls my band so <laughs> that too phil has his hand in many a pot but yes there's a theme there it seems his email be... signature is intense. Yeah, no, <laughs> people tell me I need to like, de- like, totally just not have that. It's pretty hilarious. But you know what, though, I was thinking about it the other day. What are you thinking about? The yeah. other what do you think? It's good. It's what do you bad. think, Adam? I it's it's different, but I kind of like it. It's diverse. I kind of like it. I mean, diverse in the sense that like people, I I want to put forward things I'm proud of. Yeah. Every single thing that's attached to my signature, I am incredibly proud of. Yeah, you're so, a man who wears many hats, and you have. A vehicle that could literally like survive I, these. I think you're a trailblazer outside. in email like, signatures. Yeah. I am. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know what's funny is I used to have one. I used to have one of those like JPEG version ones, whatever, and like no one could read the print. Like, and I was tired of creating like using the link tree. Mo- right, method. have different emails for different. Right, right, yeah, like, yeah, this is who yeah. I am. These are all the things. I'm these, yeah, if here's you want, links. right? These are links. Click on if you and, like, and, and if you don't, whatever. And you're a promoter. I mean, like, I think it's fair to say you guys are promoters, and you are yeah. just live music professionals, right? Like, is that what you would consider? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Absolutely, hundred percent. You know, and that's. It's amazing because, you know, my, my last podcast I did was with a friend of mine who's in bands and I played in bands with and we've been playing in different Baltimore and other projects since we, were, since we were 16 years old, putting on shows, thinking of shows, bands, this, that, and the other. And, you know, it's still involved in our lives, but, like, you guys live and breathe this stuff every day. You guys are committed yeah. full-time to live music. Like, is that is that as cool as it sounds or is it sometimes truly just It's business? scary. Yeah. It's a scary business to be in. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, it's certainly project, a lot of project to project and whatnot. But I, you know, what's funny is Adam, you were the one who inspired me to go full time with this. I remember, I remember this very well. I remember, and I hope I don't mind me sharing this. Sure. But I, I remember when we worked, Adam and I worked at Laureate together. We were on the marketing team um, in different roles, but we bonded over music and over um, European soccer and, you know, just, just, he's a really cool freaking dude. And uh, I, I, I moved on from Laureate to a startup and you were still there. And I remember like I was doing the music thing part time. I was managing Yellow Dub Marine. I was working with Ram Jam and I had fi- at that point founded the Charm City Bluegrass Festival. And had I guess we had just brought you on as our as doing all of our social media at the time. And um, I remember you, 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 you and Laureate parted ways. Yes. And I remember having a conversation with you and you're like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to find a way to be an entrepreneur and do it. So fast forward a couple of years later, and I'm in, I part ways with a company that I, you know, it was, being, it was a good corporate job and I parted ways with it. And I remember being like, well, heck, what am I going to do? And the first thing you said to me was, Phil, just go out and, and do it. And then here we are five years later, we're both yeah. doing it right in our own ways, which it's kind of cool. I, I didn't ever think personally I'd be doing this. Full, I mean, I always wanted to do music full time, but I never thought I'd, I'd figure out a way to do it. And, and, and your, your, um, tenacity you know to just do it like you know, I know it's a, a cliche from nike or whatnot but like it, there's some truth to that there's truth to that 110 percent. yeah thanks man um i'm a big believer in in following your intuition and uh <clears throat> you know choosing faith not a religious faith but just a faith in self and faith in your own journey to lean into what you're good at and and don't try so hard to fit yourself into a box that doesn't want you to be in. So it's, it's worked out. The path continues to unfold and 
I'm glad it's worked out for you. And I mean, to, to kind of give back a compliment is, um, I mean, you, you basically got me started in the music industry as a profession with bringing me on with Charm City and then your kindness and through the connections we've, you know, built in our own way. But I don't think I would be where I am without you as well. You know, so I appreciate that immensely. Yeah, and 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 it's it's funny because you and I have a lot of we're very different people in a lot of ways, but they we complement each other. I am a scatterbrained, strategic, like I like long term, big picture, big picture kind of thing, and you're you are too. You have a, this really cool innate strategic sense, but you also are are very very well versed in the minutia and understanding. Okay, how do we get to this place that we both want to get to? You know, I think of it in in the very macro sense. You're very good at the micro sense without being like overly pedantic or, or obnoxious about it. Like you're really good at knowing the steps to get there and then executing those smaller steps or at least pointing me in the right direction to do that. Right. And it's funny because I find myself a lot like you, Andrew. I don't know. For, for those who don't know, Andrew himself is a visionary. Right. He, you've been around this same. Well, no, don't don't frown because you've gone down no, a very you, well, you've gone down a very similar yeah, path, right? That, in the yeah. sense that you've wanted to start your own business as an entrepreneur. You know, you did what you needed to do to get there. You know, in tough times, you found ways to make it work. You've also found ways through your through work having to work. You know, in the corporate world, you know, when things weren't you know a hundred percent where they needed to be, and then you found a way to exit that and and become your own and grow your own brand and your own business. And the same way Adam and I like found purpose with each other, like you and I have found purpose over the last couple of years. Absolutely. You know, what Adam, what you said right. about Phil really resonates and I echo the same sentiment. Like you make things happen and you, you do them unapologetically. You do them because you want to do them and you help other people share in that vision that you have or the opportunity that you find. And, um, no, just, you know, as a partner and further insights, you've made a tremendous impact. You know, I, my band is playing the biggest party in Baltimore yeah. this weekend, thanks to you enabling that opportunity. And we always knew that we could do it, but that leap to go there is only possible when people open the door. And you, you really have done that for me and for us and been really grateful for that. But, you know, I, I think your partnership is really a unique one. And I, I, I'm wondering from the festival production perspective, like going back to when you started at Charm City Bluegrass Festival to now, like, how much of your working styles and what you guys, who you are fundamentally has persisted through that versus the things you've learned? Like, have you had to compromise or change or adapt, you know, your basic philosophies or your viewpoints against the reality of the business or have, is it more kind of a balance of both of those things? Yeah, I think Phil can probably speak to that more because he had a different partner when he started the festival. I actually came on um, as a, a working partner in its third year. So in 2015, so Phil can maybe speak more on the the starting of Charm City and and all of that. Yeah, I mean we Charm City Bluegrass as a festival grew out of my one time whiskey fueled um, Wednesday night jam. And and for the record, I'm not a musician. I am really poor. Adam will tell you. I play like three. You'll tell me. You've seen me. I play three chords very poorly. Um, but I love music. I I, I, think, I, we have, I think we have visitors. We have visitors. Hey, hey the music I mean, calls. I think, I think, don't let What's her up, jump dog? up, but I think we'll let her get the cameo. You know, say, say hi and bye, Stella. Oh, <laughs> Stella! Stella! Hey. <laughs> um, well, we'll pause for a second. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pause. It's all, it's all post-edited. Post-edited, anyway. I think, like, little moments like that are actually fantastic, so I hope we do so that was Stella, Andrew's ginormous, amazing, lovable. She's a what do we call she, Is she a pit bull? She's a full-fledged Texas pit bull. Te- Texas pit bull. I got her. With she the... was 15 pounds and wow. eight, eight weeks old, almost died of parvo. She was the runt of the litter. Yeah, you okay. never know that by being yeah. the fact that she's like as big as me. 15 pounds. A week later, she literally is busting at the seams. Incredible Hulk. I mean, pure muscle. muscle. And she's gentle. But, she is the gentlest no, giant I mean, ever. Meet. She is in like pure awe and fear of my two year old daughter. But she she's is a beautiful, truly beautiful a daughter. giant beast of a of a, yeah. of a creature. And yeah. I love her dearly. Anyway, thank so you, Stella. Yeah. Anyway, back yeah. to Charm City. So whiskey fueled Wednesday jam mm-hmm. that I hosted uh, in Hamden when when Jess and I were renting there, and it you know Jordan at the time Jordan and I were were working on the Yellow Dub Marine project. I was managing Yellow Dub. He was their tour. I had him on tour as their tour manager and photographer. And 
he Jordan himself was a fantastic guitar player, and he could pick bluegrass. We, him and I obviously bonded. Still over, is, still is, I, yeah, yeah. So I'm recently um, bonded over bluegrass music, and we said, you know, look, there's this brewery starting down the street. Like we know the people involved. Like we can make some connections, get some introductions. Like let's go to them and say let's have a bluegrass party, right? Like at the time, bluegrass was. It was big. Like it, it's all relative, right? Like big is, it was pre Billy Strings. Pre Billy Strings. You know? It was like you know Punch <laughs> Brothers. Like now, like so paradigmatic Absolutely. Billy Strings, like pre iPhone, pre Twitter, yeah, pre yeah, Billy yeah. Strings. Basically, like, it was big, yeah. like Amazing. in its own way, right? Bluegrass yeah. is still a niche genre in yeah. a lot of ways, right? But I have this side, this vision of bluegrass that I think a lot of people would would disagree with, and I know they do. That bluegrass isn't necessarily like. A particular chord set or particular rhythmic structure, right? People, bluegrass is a very defined, like the, the traditionalists would say, it has a very defined chord structure, rhythmic structure, kind of language. I don't buy into that argument, right? I think bluegrass is as bluegrass does. I think there's a lot of bands that that can be termed bluegrass that ninety percent of bluegrass fans be like you feel you're insane. But I, I disagree with that. I think I think bluegrass is what you make of it in a lot of ways in terms of the instrumentation the music, the topics, the themes. And I wanted to celebrate that. So I was like, well, you know, I've been buying some bands for Ram Jam. Like, it's time to, time to have a party. And, and you quickly learn that the skip, the leap from a party to call it a fact, there's no boundaries. It doesn't really matter. So that first year at Union Craft was, um, was really that. It was, you know, I, I brought in friends. I brought in uh, musicians that whose music I've been, like Tim O'Brien, who I've been listening to as part of Hot Rise and part of Tim, o, you know, Tim O'Brien, like solo work for year. I mean, for years at that point, I guess uh, 2013. So yeah, probably about 10 years. I, I really got into music around the early 2000s, uh, 90, you know, 98, 99, I got into Fish, Dead, which was a very easy jump into, you know, into like Peter Rowan, David Grisman, which makes it even easier to get into like Bill Monroe. And then from there you discover Leftover Salmon. Oh, Noah Pekelny is the banjo player for Leftover Salmon. Great. Noah Pekelny is playing with Chris Teeley as part of the Punch Brothers. Chris Teeley's part of Nickel Creek. Like there's this like very ebb and flow to these musicians across this genre and across the acoustic, we'll call it the acoustic genre, right? Um, and that's where really Charm City came from that first year was that was that realization. And, and I, I, I wish there were video of that that year because at the time, like it was so like that side of the market, like easily accessible video content in from a marketing perspective, like just didn't exist in the same way. I mean, it did, but you really it just wasn't as easy. And um, I know there is a tape somewhere. I can't remember who has it. I've hit them up on email. They have it on VHS. They mm -hmm. got a couple of things, but. I, I just the pictures you look back at the just pure joy of people in Baltimore to having a local bluegrass at the time it's called folk and bluegrass festival. We Adam um, when he came in was the first things he did was that <laughs> was his short name. CCB I was the Justin CCF Timberlake yeah. instead of the Facebook <laughs> Charm City Bluegrass. It works, man. <laughs> it's stuck. And that and that's and that's where it's been ever since. But we are more than bluegrass. Oh yeah, it's just a brand, you know. And as Phil said, like. You can take something very literally and you can try to put it in a box. And in my opinion, the technical bluegrass box is long buried. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't exist anymore. No, no. And to the places that it does exist, there's no business around it. It's just a it's passion. community passion project. Sort of, yeah. you know, get together family effort. But if you're going to commercially mass produce music that makes actual money. Or right. attempt to make money. Yeah. You need to embrace what bluegrass is as a community. Right, a culture. Which I'll, invites yeah. some traditional yep. bluegrass players, yep. but it also invites people that have innovated in the genre to bring in people that didn't even know, you know, maybe what a mandolin or a banjo sounds like on a stage. And, you know, I mean, you can give bands even like Mumford and Sons and the Lumineers some credit. Brothers, yeah. I mean, the Avet Brothers, absolutely. Old Crow Medicine Show. Old Crow Medicine Show. People that are now, you know, playing, you know, big, big theaters to per performing arts halls to even. Like, why shouldn't Bluegrass have a Billy Strings? Why yeah. shouldn't we have pop hits that so are bluegrass here, here's leader, even right? Chris like, Stapleton, who started in Bluegrass, yeah, with the you know, drivers. with with the Steel Drivers. And to actually you know, have this music community grow exponentially to the point where you grow the entire bass and then a portion of that bass will filter down into the traditional scene, thus improving the awareness of the traditional scene just by a volume game. You know, 
it helps it, but there are so many people still in the industry, um, and even within um, the quote unquote, you know, International Bluegrass Music Association, not quote unquote, that's what they're called, that's an association, but it's an, it's an organization that's trying to forward as well as preserve the, the genre, but there are still a number of people there that are trying to hold it back because of some strict standard of, of how it needs to be performed. And unfortunately, time moves forward and our way of relating to things, feeling about things, thinking about things changes, you know, and all of that change yields how we relate to the outside environment. So, you know, you know what's funny, Adam, I, we, I've talked to these, these people, right. And they'll tell you that, Oh, bluegrass is really only like Ricky Skaggs or whatever. And then, I, and then I'm like, well, you know, but you know, you like, you tell me you like Chris Teeley and you tell me you, you like, you know, punch brothers, like that's as far away from Ricky Skaggs as you can get and still be considered like, it, it's yeah. really funny. It's a kind of funny, like morphism of the progression of yeah. the music. And it just cracks me up. Like, I'm like, so you're telling me you like that, but then you can't get behind some of the other stuff, like the Billy yeah. Springs and whatnot. And you look at the progression of this music, right? I think, I think bluegrass has a couple of phases, right? You have everything before Newgrass revival, right? Which would be the Bill Monroe bluegrass boys right like yeah that was they set the gold standard and you can argue that I was in the 40s right yeah and through the 50s and 60s whatever. yeah i mean argue, you can argue explosion was in the 40s and right, right. 50s. You can, you, exactly you can argue that at the time that was like phase one and then you get into like the 70s when you have the emergence of bella fleck and and um and, and sam bush, sam bush thank oh, you no <laughs> sam bush and john cowan for you know new grass survival had a couple iterations but the music of new grass survival was that like hard pivot from this really like man country fuse like this what well, we're gonna say quote unquote traditional bluegrass into this new thing bluegrass. right the people still last but it's funny when when those same heads who only talk about like traditional bluegrass are like oh i love new grass revival i'm like yeah well, okay well it's like it's like anything or any genre from religion to music right. but like you know john mayer playing in the dead right. was like yeah right. people lost their minds but you have a whole new generation of people who will now forever love yeah. that oh, yeah. catalog right. of songs would have never been exposed to it because of it and when i look at the opportunity for bluegrass it's frankly a non-bluegrass person i love music but i've never been inclined to to just the more just picking style of playing Absolutely. as i transitioned from drummer to guitar player though i have really started to gain a deep respect for just travis picking let alone down mm -hmm. the line and these different styles of picking and like learning about bluegrass yeah. from you frankly has been eye-opening because like i only thought about it like that like the porch deliverance like you know, like <laughs> yeah. you know, well, you, you know, fun, yeah, little yeah, just fun fun yeah. fact. Uh, the the song "Dueling Banjos" that was on yeah. Deliverance was co-written by Steve Mandel, who is a Baltimore native. I mean, he would he was one of the first people ever to come to our festival. He was, the first, I mean, he might have been the first person through the door yeah. at our first festival, right? <laughs> wow. Like, you know, may he, may his memory be a blessing. So yeah. it wasn't that far off my interpretation. No, not really. at all. Like, but it's, but, it's but, a then thing. I, but then I but then I see a Billy Strings who I'm still getting familiar with his look, but yeah. like the impact he's making, and you look at. Well, you, you but, look at but, the, but these these shows, like, these sure, that, they, like in places like Cumberland, Maryland, where like they love their country, they love their rock, but bluegrass fits that bill and it brings people together through community and music in a way that really is difficult to do with yeah. other genres. Well, I think it, that's the core of it. I think that bluegrass needs to be further embraced as simply a brand, right? And it's a that culture, brand, right? like you yeah. mentioned, is community. It's it's based on a core of acoustic music, but it also yields to electric. Um, it gives having drums gives doesn't credence. ruin the integrity. Not at no, all. it gives right? Right. not at all. No, yeah. the dead. I mean, they had two drummers, you know, and they played bluegrass all the time. I mean, Jerry's first band was a bluegrass band, and you know, like it's just understanding the history of how bluegrass has progressed to. Well, I was in, in a commercial aspect to today is so important well, to understand where the community is today and why it needs to be embraced. But if you don't care about the community, if you don't care about the brand, then yeah, like you're going to throw a little temper tantrum and say that none of this is bluegrass. You shouldn't be calling it bluegrass. However, the alternative is death. Right. So right. Right. Well, why not embrace what bluegrass has become. been associated yeah. with to a commercially acceptable audience, a commercially well, viable audience, I should say, 
and and go from there. I think there's a perfect example that I, we haven't touched on of this is you know in around 2000, Oh Brother Where Art Thou came out, right? Yeah, monumental mm -hmm. Coen Brothers movie. Like it was a game changer for the bluegrass world because you had people like Dan Tominsky, um, Gill Gillian, Gillian Welch, Dave Rawlings. You had um, amazing and arguably Allison soundtrack. Krauss, right? Who who up until probably Billy Strings was the in my I, look, I can't guarantee this. I don't know Union her Station. numbers. Yeah, Allison Krauss Union Station though financially was probably the most financially per show highest grossing earner maybe vincent and daly but like their gospel southern church music in a lot of respects I, whatever but look where allison cross is right now touring with robert plant like a great show the ceiling right it's a great show, show. the really ceiling was, yeah. the ce but but if that's your ceiling if allison cross is your ceiling for for that that is pennies on the dollar compared to the rest of the broader music market and especially mm -hmm. when you talk about Mumford and Sons, Avid Brothers, whatever like you think Alison Krauss is big you haven't seen nothing yet right and so the ceiling for this music is so low in a lot of and I hate to say it but like bluegrass is low compared to the rest right so if it didn't progress it was going to die because financially it wasn't viable sure. now up until Billy Strings Billy Strings has kind of blown this wide open in a lot of ways um yeah. there's no one like him in the scene right now, and once again, I'm not I'm not telling you based on any numbers. I haven't seen his contracts or anything, but I would guarantee you that he's probably doing five x Allison Krauss revenue wise per show. I could be wrong, but I'd venture to say that's probably about right. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to state a number here publicly, but you know, I I work for a company where we did try to book him, and you know, at at this point, it was it was just a number that that we couldn't swing right now, or we didn't want to swing right now. You know, it's just like his his number right now is more in line with a, a mainstream a mainstream pop act a mainstream country act. pop act yeah which, like, which is amazing because incredible. like phil said you know you book a quote-unquote like pure headliner in the bluegrass industry and we're talking a fraction of that right but look at country before garth brooks absolutely absolutely okay. yeah it's the same, you know? it's, it's the same before thing. he was flying around stadiums and creating like a whole look, sh show and spectacle look at it. look at rock and roll before the beatles it existed absolutely. it existed Right. So all genres, you all know, music genres. But, but it's it's a moment. A it's and, a maturation process. And you guys are a part of creating that moment. And Charm City Bluegrass. Ten from, years in. This is our tenth year. Yeah. Tenth year you guys are Baltimorean. I love this city. And Bluegrass is the last thing I would have associated with, with Baltimore. But the more I've learned about it, and the more I connected it to the roots where I came from, Cumberland, Maryland, on, on one of my, on oh, my yeah. parents' side. like That's Bluegrass country. And then have gone to West Virginia University and gotten into oh, that yeah. part of the country. It's a really important part of our history and our culture, and even just in Baltimore. And then you look at guys like Chris Jacobs who have bridged that gap, yeah. no no pun intended, and you and what you guys have created at Charm City uh, Bluegrass. Like, it's happening, and I think people are open and receptive to it. I think from my perspective personally as a fan and somebody who's involved in the music business, like I would love to see bluegrass collaborations happen with other genres. I'd love to start mm -hmm. seeing more of that kind of thing where – we get artists together and people together through the lens of bluegrass, yeah. where it just becomes another one of the genres. Because every other genre, I just don't, I don't know that that's happened yet. But I, I truly it believe has. that there's, there's there, opp there, opportunity there. So there. I think some I, good there examples. Is more, there's more yeah. opportunity, so, like you said. I mean, there's, well, there's um, some really good what, notable examples. What, yeah, like I Del, mean, Del McCurry and the Preservation Hall jazz band. That's cool. Add an album sure. together. It's one of the best albums I've heard in the last probably fifteen years. I like, right? to hear like that. Yeah. It's super cool. Well, mine was going. My mind oh. went to Dan Tominsky and Avicii. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, when he sang, um, I can't remember Wake that song, up. Wake Me Up. Oh, sure. That's Dan Tominsky's voice from... So, but I was, in my mind, that's country in my mind. Even though it may be an Americana it's country, bluegrass artist. It's country pop. But it's that, that sense of what is... like when I think, and But I, Dan and I, Tominsky yeah. was the voice of um, George Clooney in Oh Brother, in Oh Brother, No, and I'm sure, I'm, I mean, sure he's, I'm, I'm just saying, he's like, I, I don't know that that translates to sure. the listener or a music fan as bluegrass, right? No, but I think it doesn't. You have, Wake Me Up, you don't think that does? I think I, it sounds like a country techno hit. I, I think that's right. I think okay. that's right. But just including bluegrass players into other forms of music, I, I think that's where my mind went. Like you know, Billy I mean, Strings and like Show to K. You, you know, like you in example. Baltimore. Like, I or like whoever, like getting cross genre pollination through the lens of that to me is where I, I yeah. think we're heading. But yeah. well, I, mean, you I have think Billy Strings and Post Malone well, now. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Post yeah. Malone's been a great example. Yeah. Music is great. Good music's good music, but there yeah. are. There are fundamentals, and they exist. I mean, back like in the day, you had you know, you know Run DMC and Aerosmith. That's right. That's right. You know. Yeah. I mean, which helped popularize another, you know rap as absolutely. as we know it today. I think there is there is a lot of this that does go on. Some of it doesn't get picked up in the bluegrass world, but like, here's a fun fact: 
the only bluegrass band to ever play a fish festival is the Del McCurry band. Mm. You know, I think Del is one of the one of the people that and and Del Fest hits it spot on that has done that. He's done it repeatedly. I mean, Tyler Childers and the Travel McCurries last year was one of the best sets of music I've seen in a long time. Sturgill Simpson and his, you know, he's got Sierra Hall yep. in his band. He's got Justin Moses. Unreal. You know, yeah. it's like the Cut and Grass Volume One and Volume Two. Mm-hmm. Same thing, right? These the are, last show I was going to see before the pandemic was Cut and Grass was Sturgill and Childers at University of Texas. Oh my goodness! Damn, at That's Austin, awesome. I, and then yeah, obviously incredible. then Sturgill yeah. got COVID. It was the first thing that was the end of that, and I. Yeah, I'm Chris moved, Teeley I'm from Texas now. I think, I, but I think, I'm waiting for that show again. I'd love to see that show. Chris Teeley also does it. I think his is a little more yeah. highbrow intellectually in a yeah, lot of ways. For like sure. his collaboration that he did with um, he who, transcends uh, genre. That guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who's the uh, yeah. who's the the great jazz uh, saxophone player? Um, who John runs, Batiste? No, no, not John no. Batiste. Um, his brothers, brothers. Patrick Rainey? No, no, no. There's two brothers. <laughs> no. uh, African American. Like there's. One saxophone? Trumpet, one plays saxophone. Oh, no, the, the Marcellus. The Marcellus. Thank wow. you, Marcellus. And Branford Marcellus. Marcellus. I didn't listen to yeah, that. Yeah, they, um, he, yeah, like his collaboration with oh, them yeah. is you know, just... But that, that is high art now. What they're... That world they're in, really, the Yo-Yo Ma, they're like up there. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right. I forgot about that. Even the Goat Rodeo Sessions, yeah. which are which are stored right, on the Yo-Yo Ma, Christy but, Lee, but, Fio but to the Bella Fleck, to that... Right. That, that is a... Luke, that couldn't be possible without the influence Bella of Fleck Bluegrass and Dave, Bella Fleck with Dave Matthews. No. Exactly. Exactly. But now it's different because these festivals, like Charm City Bluegrass, like the Ramble Festival, like Del Fest, down the line, are we're you guys are bringing the culture that Bluegrass created to the masses and doing that in a way that still preserves the tradition. Right. It's a real responsibility, and I know that's why you guys take it so seriously and so many other people we work with, but I just think that that... That transcends the genre. Once it's people wanting to come together, but when you can, like the Renaissance Festival, for example, like it's crazy, but it's a very similar. Right. It's people that are in a culture, but like you can still get people to come out just for the fun of it. And that's where I feel like CCP well, we has to, kind of gotten to. We try also. to talent by with a focus on that, right? Like we try to find, I think it's reflective in our last couple of headliners His Golden Messenger, mm-hmm. Deer Tick, Devil Makes Three, The Bridge. Like, Lone Bellow. Lone Bellow. Like, well, these are our, our headliners, and, and they're reflective of that same feeling, right? Something where we know that it, it's not quite necessarily bluegrass, but it's got enough of something there that even the casual bluegrass fan can yeah, But look how much of a Tyler simply, Childers thing was controversial at Delphi. I remember A lot that. of people were pissed off because it brought people in, right, that weren't necessarily bluegrass community people, and that brings some yeah. weird behavior yeah. with it, and... People acting rowdy because Tyler is such a popular a country, country star, yeah. Americana artist. But to your, the opposite is what that these festivals stop happening and have diminishing returns. Like if we're going to support bluegrass, we have to find ways to do that. But like even Tyler Childers, who's a close genre, that's a leap. So like I just wonder what is yeah. that? What does that dichotomy look like? You know, it's just it's it's a lot of ego at play in terms of 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 being you're so about individual, resistant. Pa- your individual patron ego. Ego in the sense of being so resistant to call something bluegrass that isn't that wasn't bluegrass in the 1940s, right? You know, so it's, it's fundamentalism in anything. It's a right? it's yeah. a it's a word that has been contextualized, has been passed through the the decades in various forms as people relate to what bluegrass is very differently. But why should we fight what it is today, especially if we're able to build? events from it and and community from it like support more artists by getting more people to come and that's right seems to be the work of the promoter at the end of the day right to right really get back and to i mean artists. this is a commercial venture i mean bluegrass was always a commercial venture bill monroe started it as a commercial venture sure the music lives on porches and communities where there isn't money exchanged but in the tech, in the context of utilizing it as an industry, it doesn't matter, you know, if if it doesn't fit your ideology Look, if people of something can't make in the '40s and the '50s because it's viable in a certain context. So let's embrace it mm-hmm. and let's continue mm-hmm. to welcome people into the community that get influenced by other bands in the industry, but might not sound exactly like a 1940s 1950s bluegrass band at the end of the day if you can't make money in it and and if the industry can't sustain itself financially then what's the point right and that it's doesn't mean die. you have to like make yeah. old town road every year for bluegrass to be successful we don't have to like completely no. demit but like it's here and people i think but i think the live event 
the live event pers- perspective of bluegrass getting away from where the commercial side like commercial but the songwriting and production like these events are like some of the biggest things in a lot of towns now like bluegrass festivals absolutely sure like it I mean, is a it's an industry. I mean, it's just you talk American to Allegheny yeah. County. You, you oh, talk to it. Allegheny County how much Delfest means to that, it's that area, yeah. which has been decimated by the opioid crisis, um, among other things. You know, from an economic standpoint, um, it, it's it means a, it means a lot. It means a lot. And you can't necessarily do that with every genre yeah. because the community isn't necessarily the same. You know, look what happened with uh, Astro World. Remember Travis Scott? Oh, yeah. Down? People got trampled and die and yeah. that kind of behavior. You're not getting that at a bluegrass. And I think that's probably the fear of some of the people that maybe are resistant because preserving the simplicity of it and the pureness of it, right, maybe against seeing what it could be if you open it up too wide, that's probably, like, the balance, right, that people are trying to strike. Billy Strings uh, says it best in our documentary. We did a documentary in 2016. We interviewed Billy as part of it, and he said, man— I'm going to quote him. It's something like that you can find on the internet on YouTube. Go to uh, our YouTube channel, which is Charm City Bluegrass. Bluegrass, right? Thank you for the plug. Uh, I think he goes, you know what, man? I'm going to just quote him. It's fucking music. It's yeah. just fucking good yeah. music. Wise words. And, and like, at its simplest form, he's 100% right. Um, that's what it is. We're drawn to it because aesthetically it is pleasing to something that we, in our ears, and our brain contextualizes into pleasure. Right, like, why do you, I mean? You're not gonna listen to music that you don't find pleasure from. You're gonna, yeah. you're gonna scream and run the other direction. Or you can, you can, you can go to. <clears throat> there are still traditional bluegrass festivals. Like, you can go to a Delaware Valley bluegrass festival, oh, and the, it'll the be the Clodner Brothers. What they do here in like showcasing the old, like yeah. old time music festival. Yeah, there's, there's definitely plenty of outlets for that. Yeah, you, right. can, you, you can, can do, do that. that. I, I, gotta, I gotta give Brad and and and, and the old time credit because yeah. they're the old time festival is kind of in a sense super cool in that. It's not just old timey music. They actually have a lot of. If you look at, down to the artists there, there's a ton of diversity, and the people they bring in are incredibly diverse musicians. It's incredibly fun, and it's it's not what I would consider like traditional in some respects. I mean, yeah, there's some of that, but it's it's different. It, it's even more creative and artistic and, and beautiful than that. Yeah, like, but I'll 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 say one thing about what what Brad um, and and Alex and Patrick has have sort of cultivated here in baltimore every week they host a jam i mean th- brad hosts multiple i mean He's maybe dozen, maybe dozens house of concerts. house concerts yeah. at his place you know the community that he has built and cultivated year round is is why a festival like the old time festival can bring in as many people yes. as it does for such a small segmentation of commercially viable music which is old time music it's not it's not something that is um, i mean we're we're talking about you know bluegrass being a niche of a yeah, niche yeah old time is a like, niche of a niche of a niche exactly right. but it it takes that community you know building and yes. and continuous outreach in where people Come for the music, yes, but also to come to see their friends. But I've seen some and their family members as well. I've seen some incredibly diverse music at Brad's house. Over, yeah, over absolutely. The years. It's I not mean, just strictly bluegrass. Correct. Or... Like Sierra, Fer- I mean, you could find Sierra Farrell there. We've I've seen Twisted Pine there. Songs from the Road Band there. I mean, absolutely. Right. So it's it's more than that. He's like one of the best ambassadors for the genre across multiple right. streams of the niche. But there, but that's not even. I don't even consider that like traditional. Like, you know, it's it's like. Um, it's like, not like, like Upper Co, for example, right? Like, that is a very traditional bluegrass festival, you know? The Crisfield down in Tangier, mm. a traditional, traditional-ish bluegrass festival. And they have, their, they have their markets, and they have the people that go there. But can you ever see them getting over 10,000 people, 5,000 people? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just. Gray Fox might be the exception to the rule. Yeah, but, but even then that, they bring in the string dusters. They bring in right. progressive acts. Yeah, Leftover Sam and Railroad Earth. Green I mean, they Sky. had Billy Strings for two years in a row. Right. You so, know? you know, I think that's... Green a, Sky, right. Everybody's right. finding ways to invest in... Steve Canyon the Rangers. Rangers. Yeah. yeah. So that's the point, right? Is, Hold that thought. Let's make sure we don't cut off. I will let it... Hold it. Don't worry. your time. Okay. Okay, so anyway, you know... Anyway, it, it's, <sighs> is the question is, you know, when Gray Fox founded... Did they, were they, as a first-time festival, 
in this position, right? I mean, I know they went through a couple of iterations with Winterhawk and, and what yeah. Mary Dobb was doing. Mary Dobb for 40 yeah, and Mary, years. Yeah, and Mary Dobb was a complete visionary. She is... Absolutely. A, I'm, I, Mary, I love you, and if you ever listen to this, you're a fucking badass. Pardon my language. It's true. There is no one cooler in this industry than Mary Dobb. And she was a visionary, right? The, the, the way she started a festival is an example for all to follow, and her ability to be a pioneer and her ability to pivot to, you know, to this is, is unmatched. And I, as a first-time festival, I didn't know Mary when I started Charm City Bluegrass in my first year. <laughs> and in my second great. year, I didn't know Mary. I knew her <laughs> after my second year because when you get someone coming up to you, literally, like, they slap you upside the head and say, you know the founder of Gray Fox is here and she bought a ticket and you put her on the guest list and you're like... And that person was Jerry Douglas. That person was Jerry Douglas. <laughs> you're like... Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> Already then, he introduced me to Mary. He literally slapped me inside that. What's wrong with you, kid? You know, like, and and Jerry and I uh, pay your dues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jerry's a great guy, um, and obviously known him for a couple of years. But Mary and I have become really close in Adam as well. And and so you know, the, I, I asked her, I was, you know, how did you come into this? How did you find? you know, form your first vessel. You know her question, she responded with, Phil, how did you form your first vessel? <laughs> right. so you had a bad idea, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think a lot of festivals form out of that. They come out of these ideas, these visions for what a community could be, what a community of artists, when artists and fans come together, what do you want to see in an event, right? How do you want to interact with your community? And that's, I think, Ramble Fest is a great example of a first time festival that put community first, ahead of everything else. Um, I think there's something there. I think there is certainly a path to follow. Um, what do you think? I mean, you've been you've been a yeah. part of like your fresh grass down in, in Arkansas, right? Yeah, it's not a yeah, first I mean, time festival, but it, that was for that location. Yeah, absolutely, community first, and I think that trumps everything over some sort of trying to fit a, a, a specific name into a very specific definition. It doesn't it doesn't matter. Whatever people want to call something, as long as it brings them together, is ultimately what matters and yeah with fresh grass i mean fresh grass started up in north adams massachusetts still going strong um and then we just started a new festival down in bentonville arkansas we just had our second festival this past uh may and you know we we have bands like emmylou harris and um Warren gary TV, right? and uh, Gary Clark Jr. Mm. and and all types of bands, rock dispatch. and roll. You had dispatch. We had dispatch. Yeah. Um, all different types of bands that <clears throat> that we have through Fresh Grass. They don't all fit into a very strict definition of bluegrass. Um, but we we call all of the bands that are we bring into the festival a part of the Roots community. They all have an affinity for putting on a show that our audience that we've cultivated over ten plus years. We know the like. Like we had flogging Molly, That's which great. is a punk, punk Irish. Like right? we punk, covered that punk, in uh, your Halloween show. Punk pop. That was you know, Kick Murphy's. Kick Murphy's. <laughs> yeah, band. flogging Molly is a New England, you know, based, uh, you know, punk rock band or like punk pop rock band, whatever sure, you want to call I mean, it. Irish traditional music strings exactly. sitting down and playing music. That's about. That's a, the point of that. Organic, it's like how does. How does that fit in? Well, it's because of those roots and how it's and how they have built from those roots to translate the music into to what actually makes sense for people who today. Gary Clark Jr. or another, but exactly. it's still Gary Gar at its core. Gary Clark Jr. Traditional music. I just saw Gary, Gary Clark Jr. for live for the first time um, this past September, and the way that he can play blues is just as good as the Taj Mahal, who we also had. So like. That's one of the best shows I've ever seen. Gary Clark Jr. at ACL. He played with the Foo Fighters. Like, Absolutely. So it was, I went, one stage was Gary Clark. Yeah. Then I went to the other stage. The other side of the field was Foo Fighters, and they played together. Yeah. And I mean, but we'll still just, get emails. Oh. We'll still get emails from people that say, you know, how is a band like that bluegrass? And it's right. like, it doesn't. We have don't to be. really respond because, right. from a strict definition standpoint, he's not bluegrass. But from a community standpoint, he's a part of the community. The crowd loved him. Right, you know, so well, it's like, like how is he? How is he bluegrass? Well, because the people that we've cultivated over the years, you know, enjoy that type of music too. Everybody's not so narrowly focused on traditional bluegrass. People like all different types of things, and there's a, there's a certain limit to it. And those bands we typically don't, you know, bring into these type of festivals, but they're all part of the community and and pushing the boundary maybe bringing in a band that has never played a roots music quote unquote festival is a bit of a risk but it's something that you know we go on from a gut instinct and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't 
but the intent of expanding the genre and expanding the community is there. And that's all that matters. And when the community's in place, to your guys' point, yeah. then you can learn from them and share things you know they're going to like and it's good. provide things. And I guess is that... It's is, quality yeah. music. It's authentic. It's, um, it's, it's not it's manufactured. Music, it's not built in a it's laboratory. Really like, right. I think if but you're going to put... It's in, the, it's in the eye of the beholder, it sounds like. It's like absolutely. At a local or regional level... Whether it's bluegrass or not by somebody else's definition is irrelevant. If the people that have been a part of building that yeah. festival or that event keep coming back for it and they trust the promoters to bring in the right talent, exactly, it doesn't matter, right? I think it's that sense of authenticity in a band. I think that's what people crave, and that's what bluegrass, quote-unquote, um, offers to a large extent. It's simply authenticity. Is that band authentic? Are they good, are they good players in what they're doing, and do they bring a good vibe? Yeah. Do the rules of bluegrass as a business apply to other genres or is it truly is every genre different against the basic Are you talking, fundamentals? You're talking about like a, at a festival level? I'm talking about at a festival let's go to a festival level I was thinking more high level genre but like at a festival level or at an event production level promotion level is it all the same? It's all the same. But there's just things to consider about the, the audience. audience. Right and that's, right? A, that's, a, that's coming down to marketing like that's a marketing right. play so, it's not a fundamental business play because right. the business of an event is the business of an event. I can right. tell you I've run Enough events across multiple genres to tell you that porta pots still cost the same, the right. fences still cost the same, the sound equipment. So there's no difference in the sound equipment. Okay, maybe you're right, renting. Like an people extra want to take ownership of what they think things should be, but right. it doesn't really matter. It I doesn't guess, the matter. Bottom line. It's the bottom yeah. line. If something's profitable, exactly. successful. Who cares if some people don't like it? If the majority of people do, then you got to follow that ultimately, right? It, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a there's. Product. I think with anything, there's probably product. core tenets of of what you need to follow in terms of of how you put together a band and, and how you market that particular event, um, you know. But just, I'm, I'll just speak on what I know, which is Roots Music and Bluegrass. It's like, just making sure people, again, understand that the bands that are brought in are serious musicians, are in terms of like how, how they can shred the, or how how heady they can play their particular yeah. instrument, run, bro. Heady um, how it makes you feel. Like a lot of funk has sort of gone into the bluegrass community as well because it's just, it's good vibe music. It's it's fun to dance to. You know, you can you can get a little bit of funk and you can get a little bit of banjo. Like it's, they're both going to make you like bop in a, in a, in a like certain little you way. Like, you you know? sound like you're describing a, a band that I work with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Aren't you your boogie? Excuse me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's going to hell of a show, man. Yeah. Hey, Sorry, I had, to, I had to get the plug and in. And there's the young, plug, there's the the young bands like Armchair Boogie that, that are sort of picking up on that vibe and, and running with it. We just sold out our Halloween show. Well, we. we I'm saying we. We just sold out our Halloween show at the Majestic Madison as yeah. of uh, 8 o'clock this morning. Fantastic. Thank you. I did two days in advance, I called it. Said it was going to sell out on Thursday. And Congrats, look, but I mean, to, anyway, to sorry, kind no, of no, maybe... We've, we've been going on this for, yeah. for some time, but to me, just to end it from, from my standpoint, times change, you know, and that's from, you know, a political standpoint, socioeconomic standpoint, religious. everything around us, <laughs> religious standpoint, yep. our environment changes, people call. think differently, yeah. people feel differently, totally. people relate to things differently, and if you're going to want something to continue from decade to decade... You also have to pivot and adjust to the environment. Well, you know what? So it's, it's important, like a band like Armchair, they can inf they they get they sense that that funk has been infused in the genre, so they put it in their band and they pay homage to bluegrass as well. And, and, and Armchair is as good of a band player as I've ever heard. So like anybody's got a problem right. with them playing with other instruments, it's like go away. They're well, going to be outdated. Just, There's, yeah, they're not yeah. playing to that market. They're playing to a fresher. More expanding market, but still, but still preserving. I feel but like everybody, these, these people that would have been fans if there was a little more funk in the trunk, be a bit, they'll yeah. still funk be in the trunk. Yeah. You, but you asked Absolutely. us a very important question: is is does this rule apply? And I actually just thought about it in that little segment there. I just thought about something, Adam. Remember when? So Adam and I talent bought the Fells Point Festival. Yeah. Right? And one of the first things they said to us when we when we took on this project was, we can't be doing things the same old way. Like we just can't, right? Fells Point for years had had you know your let we'll call them legacy pop radio rock, right? Is there a better nineties alternative? Nineties alternative. Rock band. That, SR that, seventy one. SR seventy one. Gin year. blossoms. Whatever. I mean, SR seventy one was two thousands. I mean, we're talking gin blossoms. Yeah. We're right. talking right. So we were tasked with with and but the fundamentals don't change. Right. 
right? The so business is the, the business, business is the business. But the people that you're dealing with Correct. and what their expectations are. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So we were tasked with, you know, you may change it up, you know, evolution or, or you or you fail. And so we put together, I think, arguably an incredible lineup. I mean, our original the lineup original lineup yeah. was, was mind blowingly good, diverse, genre wise, music wise, talent wise, working within the so budget that we had. Working budget we had, and and it's fun. It's fun. It's interesting to think about this. So so yeah, the rules across the board are the same: evolve or die. Yeah, like I hate to say it so much. Diminishing returns versus uh, you know acceleration right. and growth. It's like it's a, it's a right. matrix that people. Can control or not exactly but you you are totally in control of your of the way you see things and your vision for things and and i think like to bring it all home like i guess when i started charm city bluegrass that was my like yeah i want to throw a bluegrass party but you know at the end of the day like it, you know and then that first year i mean well, i wouldn't call it traditional i mean you had tony trishka you know tim o'brien chris jacobs They're closer to the tradition closer yeah. to the tra tradition but not but not but, through and through tradition but not through, yeah. through right exactly and and getting into year two you know you had jerry douglas band and um, Noah Pakelny and Friends, which consisted of basically the Punch Brothers minus Chris Teeley, right. Matthew O'Donovan, but but Jerry Douglas Band, man, Jerry is the most one of the most recorded musicians of all time, and he can play with the traditional bluegrassers till his heart comes home. But then he can go bring out a band where it was him and Victor Krauss and a drummer and and, right. and it was supposed to be Luke Bulla, but Luke broke his fingers. Say Gabe Witcher on fiddle, and Gabe's in the Punch Brothers and. And musically, it was like because it's just music. It's only music. It's, just, it's a language, and it's when a language exactly. When you break down that barrier. Ding ding ding. It, we yeah. can connect as human beings, and I think that's the best part about and our audience. But our audience responded to yeah. it. They loved it. Our audience was, is open-minded enough, and I, I have to really applaud the Charm City Bluegrass audience mm -hmm. and community because we rarely anymore. I think rarely we get complaints about our. We ignore them. It we just doesn't. Them. It doesn't. We just don't it care. doesn't. For you matter. out there, trolls don't. Do trolls, trolls, you know? Don't don't complain because we're just going to ignore it and we're going to keep doing what we do, which is we, bringing the we best. See, we see. some of our social media managers might respond to your comment <laughs> if it's. <laughs> we'll see. We see them. Yeah. We and, see them. And, and, and if it's a, and we it's, joke about them. If it's a compliment or I mean, if it's a complaint that's valid, like okay, obviously we'll address it. Yeah, we'll address it. And um, but if you're complaining about like, but yeah, about a, like the type of band like he's bringing his golden messenger, like. Dude, come on. We're just going to laugh. Put on a better at... festival yourself and make it profitable. Right, right, right. 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 We're just going to exactly. laugh at you behind Facebook. We're not going to publicly, like, you know, yeah, chastise yeah. you. But Adam and I will it have a good It just doesn't matter. It, it doesn't in line, align with the yeah, vision. Exactly. I, um, if, if somebody doesn't have a good time other than, you know, the, the music, then that's something we take seriously. If, yeah, if right. there's, you know, something like that we take seriously. But to expand the festival, um, to allow people to bring in music that yields good times, to bring in vendors that people love, which is such an important aspect of the festival. Um, everything else just is chatter. It the just food. doesn't matter, especially in, food. in the in the context of, you know, social media and 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 armchair you know and um armchair boogie. <laughs> backseat drivers. Backseat yeah, drivers. Backseat drivers. That's a great yeah, that's a great that's, that that that's a great bluegrass band name. We by should the way. start that backseat, backseat drivers. drivers. I got I got a mandolin. Adam plays guitar. Same. No, I agree. Yeah. No, it's an interesting perspective. Can you play can you play the banjo? But, yeah. I'll figure it out. <laughs> anyway. uh, it's three chords and anything. Uh, so in closing, I, I really this question is one I, I hope will really help people because I think there's a lot of people out there that uh, have started festivals or have or included in communities that are trying to get music festivals or maybe want to start a music festival themselves one day. Like, if you were going to start, let's just say bluegrass. If you're going to start a bluegrass festival from scratch today, and you had no money, literally no money, like just whatever you were able to personally invest or willing to lose. What would you do? How would you go from there to where you guys are now in year what of Charm City? Ten. This will be our tenth year the of the tenth tenth, tenth year, year. Of, of Charm City Bluegrass, but it's really our ninth. So COVID knocked a COVID couple, knocked a couple of festivals off. Almost the... tenth year. Of well, it's Charm ten City years of twenty. It's twenty thirteen yeah. to twenty twenty three. Right. 20. So ten years of Charm City Bluegrass yeah. as an organization. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you take all that wisdom and knowledge and this of this brand, and this don't business, do this community. So you say don't do it. That's your advice for a first timer. Yeah, I'd say don't do it. Yeah. I, here's <laughs> and here's why because it's just gonna break your heart. Mm -hmm. She's a fickle lady, man. Right. It's no, take a lot of trial and error. A lot of, yeah, and I think that's the no point. No matter how much be you know about the right. business, exactly. Be willing to lose your shirt a couple times on the way to to get there because it, building that community is the hardest part. The music is the music. Like you could pay anyone to play. Like it that, that that's that's the easy part. The easy part is is paying musicians, right? Like as long as you pay them. Like that's the easy part. The hard part is building the community. The hard part is 
is setting up that community to prosper in, a, in an environment where they're, they're going to want to be. Like, that's the hard part, man. That takes years, years of cultivation. And I will say, I've seen it done quickly. I, I, you know, Ramblefest is a good example of that. Arguably the best example of community, in my opinion, is Delfest. But, you know, I think that's, I, I don't know, what do you think? You think that community is the hardest part? We've touched on that a few times. Yeah, I mean, Freshgrass has an incredible community. Um, but they take in, years to cultivate. But, you know, we're, we, just, we just completed our 11th year. You know, um, the first year of fresh grass, we had a couple hundred people. I mean, first year of Charm City, they had about a thousand, um, which was amazing. But it's it was smart how they, you know, how Charm City, you know, first started is they paired with you know a uh, up and coming, uh, cool brewery. You know that attracted an audience too. It's like utilizing. I I would say like as a thought experiment, if I mean you can't you can't do it with no money. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean. Well, like you know, you're whatever you're willing to purse. Like, if but that's different have, for everyone. I think I think it's that's a very, it's a very sure. different. Sure, but thing let's for okay. Let's say let's would, let's let's say you have five thousand dollars and some friends. Yeah. So could you, focus. Could, could you start a festival? Absolutely. Well, yeah. Well, maybe. It, it you depends. You could throw a party. You could throw a party. I mean, you know, like a at, party. Could you could you build? Don't focus yeah. on don't focus on the big bands in in the space. Focus yeah. on but you all. Say community. If you just build so community, I here's the thing. I was easier. It was easier back then because I had started. So. Charm City Bluegrass Facebook page was originally the, the, I think I called it like the Baltimore Bluegrass Music something, right? Like I invited all my friends who I'd seen at like Smooth Kentucky shows. I had, I had you know, maybe picked with them once. I had seen them at like a Matsu Pang show. I invited them all this page, right? And it was a, it was a forum in the, in the early days just to like post, a, you know, YouTube videos of bands that we liked. So I already had a following. I already had like a thousand or two thousand Facebook likes on the page before I even created the festival. So I knew from a total attainable market cap, right? I had an audience of local people to right. to, to talk to. But like, if if somebody just like starts today and books yeah. a band, it's probably not going to work because people aren't necessarily. Well, already you would be, too, my, right? my biggest piece of advice if you're if you're just starting out is partner with yeah. other community members, whether it's an artist that does cool designs or, or whether it's a great food vendor that you know has a buzz about it. Or whether it's a, a band that packs a hundred person room like every time they play, you know, partner with those particular people so that you're bringing in. There's going to be a little bit of, of an overlap, probably, but ultimately you partner with brands at a local level if your budget is super slim that are cool and have a a buzz about them. That's where you start, you know, because. You trying to play a game where you're bringing in major acts, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars. So if you have investors that can inject money like that, then yes, like you can start to look at that type of thing. And then you'll have to negotiate with the venue, a fee. Do you get a cut of the beer, alcohol revenue? Do you get a cut if they serve food? Like, is that gonna be an issue with the vendors coming in? Like there's all sorts of things that you'll have to sort of work out. And then permitting, like what do you, what do you have to pay your county or your city? in terms of entertainment permits, in terms of like taxes, like whatever. Start with the bands, artists, vendors that have a buzz around it and sell it out your first year. Start it super small, like a 200, 300 person venue, you know, and go from there and then blow it out on social media as much as you can, TikTok, all the things, and Twitter, Instagram, Instagram, Instagram <laughs> they call Facebook, it. You know, smash. <laughs> um, and just go from there. It's it's not gonna be something you can go from from zero to Delfest or zero to fresh grass in a year. Sure. And if you have that expectation, you're gonna lose a lot of money. Sure, a lot of money because you're gonna go for all of these like crazy high expensive stuff, artists, production, everything, and you're not going to get the input in terms of revenue that that you're expecting. So. It start takes small. Time, right? Plus, don't even, look, don't even understand start like your the brand building, the logo building, the art, like the right. website, all that stuff. But it, all, but all, and all that stuff can be cheap time, too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you it's know, what to do organically. That you guys are like, you sh you're. Is that what you're saying? Build yes. it organically. Don't yeah. jump to the end result. The end game is maybe not even there. It's going to take time. You're saying don't do it, and that's a funniest piece of advice. And I think your perspective on it is sound. If, pe 
You have to be willing to. It depends to, on the expectation. Right. Yeah, I think that's yeah. Like, yeah that's that's so, really what I mean. Yeah. Is like, no, no, I get it. I think it's just it's a fun. It's, those are those are two really interesting answers because on one hand it's like look, start small, learn, get your hands you know dirty, and like you know kind of learn by trial and error. The other perspective is look, you're gonna get burned. It's gonna hurt, but ultimately, yeah. if you are willing to endure the learning and invest in building this community and serving them over ten years, you're gonna have a successful. Or don't experience. do it. Or don't or do don't it. do it because yeah. it's going to take ten years. But right. that's, at like, least the calculus. And we're still, we're still if right. you're if you're in this business yeah. to solely make money, then yes, like do not do it right. because yeah. that's not it's not what it is. Right. That's not the beast. It's not about it's not about making a lot of money. That's not what this is. Once again, we go back to the original statement of this total attainable market for the genre. Right. If you're looking to start a bluegrass festival, I wouldn't do it. Right. If you're looking to start a music festival with a, a broad based community and a diverse audience. Go for it, right. and 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 do it. Start small, start very methodically, build a community from scratch. Yes, if you're looking to start a bluegrass festival, nah. What have you guys learned through this business that applies to anyone? Just advice you've unearthed through the work you've done. Is there like maybe three things you each could kind of say that you think are really sound pieces of advice? People will surprise you at every turn, and. There are some people who have an incredible, amazing talents, and until you challenge them, you have no idea what they're capable of. Um, I think there's, I, I'm not gonna name names, but I know for a fact there's people on our staff, teammates, people who I value as friends, who because they took initiative, because they worked hard, they have, I've seen just amazingly beautiful things because of that, and I'm very thankful to even been like a small part of that. Um, that's one thing I've kind of, you know, embrace that. I think that's just like the most important. Embrace people, embrace your friends, um, you know, be honest with yourself about what you're capable of, what your time can maintain. It's the biggest thing I'm probably guilty of is, is my time. I'm horrible at time management. I know that about myself. Um, I, I often bite off more than I can chew, but that's how I function. I, I don't know how to function any other way personally um i mean adam i think you can you'll attest to that you've seen that time and time again andrew you too like time and time again like uh, you know that's why you bring in compliments because i mean there's right, a lot exactly i mean you're an incredible connector big picture guy you know and then um you know doing you know an but action you find, oriented person right you find the people who can compliment you sure i think exactly that, i think that's yeah. the last piece of the puzzle right so it's recognize the people who are good recognize yourself and then recognize ways to overcome your shortcomings I think that's life in general, and I'm still learning, man. Like I'm, I, I, I learn every day. I, I, I am constantly surprised, and I, I shouldn't be, but I am at what I don't know. And, I, and there's something beautiful about that. I really like that, and I'm not perfect, man. I'm, I'm far from it. I'm, I'm constantly evolving and changing, and, and yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just you have to overcome those things. It's really hard. It's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say. Um Focus on community, like I said, you know, like if, if you want to build a brand, um, embrace where you currently are, embrace the other people and artists that are doing things cool where you currently are, connect with them and see how you can collaborate. That's how you can grow together. Um, second is just the business side of it, you know. You don't have to be a dick. You really don't. But you do have to be firm about some stuff. Um, you have to follow up and you have to have boundaries about yourself. And if, if those boundaries are taken advantage of or, you know, people are trying to kind of pull fast ones here and there, like you have to confront that. That's part of business. And to shy away from those type of conversations I think is a detriment to yourself and you ultimately lose. You don't have to confront those type of conversations in a aggressive and abusive way, but finding your center and bringing yourself to those conversations um, firmly is important. One more. One more. One more. That was great. One more. And Visual. I mean, what, what comes to mind is just something that, that happened with us most recently at Freshgrass is, you know, we had a, an amazing reaction to a poster that we posted out um, for this year's Freshgrass North Adams Festival. 
Um, and it was the biggest reaction we had to an aspect of our brand for anything that we put out, lineup included. Um, and we had an incredible lineup. It's just the power of a visual representation of that community in a piece of art, whether it's a poster or it's a piece of merchandise, otherwise a wearable. Um, don't underestimate the impact of that. It's